morning, good evening, and hello to everybody joining into this webcast. Uh, today I'll be speaking about the isosmelt technology, where I'm looking at the longevity and adaptability uh, for smelters worldwide. Uh, so we've been talking a lot today about uh, where we take the, the materials that we mine. Uh, we've looked at the milling and the flotation steps through our isomill and our Jamison cell technologies. Uh, and in the previous presentation, we looked at one of the options for further, pro further processing these concentrates, and that's through leaching. Uh, so within the current presentation, what we wanted to look at is uh, the alternative, and that's looking at smelting these materials uh, with our isosmelt technology. Uh, and then this will lead on into the following presentation after our live cross to Mount Isa, which will be covering the uh, Isa Kid technology, which is for copper refining. So all this is about is the recovery of our base metals uh, from our concentrates. Uh, so this is the main focus of smelting, but it's not the only focus. Uh, so we don't just cover the traditional mining with the isosmelt technology. We also look at what we can recover from the urban mines in the surroundings. So what we're looking at here is the recovery of the base metals, so the copper, the nickel, the lead, and the zinc. Uh, but also, we're really focused on the recovery of all of the precious metals. So that's through from the gold and silver all the way through to all of the PGMs. But first of all, what is isosmelt and how does it work? So the isosmelt is a tall steel furnace, uh, which is, uh, has a refractory brick lining. Uh, and within it, uh, as you'll see on the image, there's a, a central lance. Now we drop feed into the top of the vessel through an open port and this falls directly into the turbulent molten bath. Now the bath is made turbulent from the uh, air and oxygen that we add through the central lance. So slag splashes onto the lance and the refractory walls uh, from this turbulence of the bath and then this allows it to be protected from the corrosive conditions of the bath itself. So it coats and then protects through a frozen layer of the slag. Now the off gas from the smelting process is taken out through the top uh, through a port uh, which leads into a waste heat boiler which cools uh, the gas and then allows it to be sent uh, to a cleaning facility either through a bag filter or an electrostatic precipitator uh, before it goes on to further uh, off-gas processing. Now the molten products are then tapped uh, periodically or continuously uh, from the base of the vessel through uh, one of uh, a number of open tap holes and then down a launder either to a subsequent furnace or to uh, a different part of the process. Now what are the advantages of the isosmelt? So put, uh, put in a number of uh, very uh, simple points. Uh, the main one I'll touch on first is that it's a very simple technology and a low cost furnace. It's a very high productivity for its footprint and that's due to the intense mixing of the, the slag zone. It has minimal footprint, so therefore it's an easy retrofit into existing plants and there's very minimal feed preparation required. It's just a simple mixing for moisture homogenization and then it can be dropped inside the vessel. Uh, there's no requirement for, gr for, for grinding the concentrates or drying or any other complicated uh, feed preparation units. Uh, it's a very low dust production for any technology, so many sites achieve less than 1% dust. And also the slag can, and metal can, or mats can be settled from the actual furnace uh, very easily through gravity settling to achieve very low levels of valuable metals within the slag. Now the furnace can be designed both cooled or uncooled and in our uncooled furnace linings, uh, one of which the furnace technology we'll see in Mount Isa coming up, uh, we're able to achieve very long furnace campaign lives. So I'll let Ben Hogg and the site guys go through that with you as the real world examples uh, once we cross to the site. And another additional benefit of this technology is that it really accepts any type of fuel to be added into the furnace. So we have sites running secondary fuel, uh, pneumatic coal, uh, natural gas, diesel, or even other forms of waste products to actually generate any heat that's required for the process. But now to move on to the isosmelt package. So what's actually involved uh, in terms of an isosmelt furnace and the isosmelt technology? Uh, so simply put, it's a submerged lance technology 
and it's a very low capital and energy efficient and flexible technology. We have plants worldwide and on the slide here I've shown plants from Europe uh, in uh, the Arubus Lunum plant as well as the Umicore plant in Hoboken as well as our plants for treating lead uh, concentrates in China and uh, one of the Glencore operations in Zambia which is a copper concentrate smelter. So what's actually involved when someone approaches us and asks for, uh, they have a concentrate and they want to look at treating it uh, to produce a final metal product? So what we look at first is uh, look through our, our technical technology and see do we have established plants that treat this material and then we can look at applying uh, very known real world cases to solve uh, what happens with these concentrates. Now if we don't have uh, any uh, sites or if the client has very specific problems which are an addition to what's happening uh, with a typical copper concentrate, then we go on to do the process development and the, the work required to pilot and prove uh, this material. Uh, so next we apply a specialist process design and knowledge from the t over 25 years of plant design and construction in terms of working out how we would treat this concentrate and the exact furnace design that would be applied. We then transfer this know-how to our clients and also our clients engineering teams so that we can construct the right furnace and the right solution for that particular case. We then supply a number of the important critical core bits of equipment for the smelting plant to ensure that it can function uh, as it is required and designed. We then also take our clients uh, operators uh, through tr various site specific training programs so they can get real world experience in running an ISO smelt and understanding all of the intricacies involved uh, before they actually have to commission their own plant. Uh, we then provide commissioning assistance where we send teams of people from both Glencore Technology and uh, Glencore as a whole to assist these sites to achieve uh, their plant performance as quickly as possible. And then we have ongoing site support and technical support for our sites to ensure that they're able to maximise their benefits and continuously improve their performance. So in terms of what equipment that we supply, we supply everything from the lancers to the furnace feeders, the actual sh steel shell uh, that, that contains all of the molten bath. Uh, we also even uh, supply the blowers as well as all the other individual components of the smelting furnace. Now more importantly, when we look at the transfer of our technology to clients, I touched on this briefly before, but I just want to touch on it again. It's our training programs, and they're what's really critical to our ability to assist our clients and for the eyes of smelt uh, technologies which we've sold throughout the world to achieve the very fast ramp up curves. Now we put the operators and also the technical personnel of our clients uh, through training programs, uh, both in terms of the fundamentals as well as the actual operating procedures on a site. Uh, many of them spend uh, approximately three months on site in Mount Isa to learn the process, but then also depending on the exact flow sheet, we can send them to other sites within the Isa smelt family or within the Glencore smelting group so they can learn the particular aspects of the furnace smelting technology that are required. We then also ensure that they're trained on how to use their process control system as well as then continue with that training on site through coal commissioning and then hot commissioning to give our clients and their staff all the skills they need to successfully run their plants. So what I'll use to, to further reinforce this is a number of the ramp up curves of the, uh, the ISO small plants uh, which have been commissioned to date. So here on the slide you'll see that there's uh, after two months of operation, pretty much all of these plants, so these are very large copper smelters treating in excess of 1 million tonnes per annum, are able to achieve 80% of their design capacity within two months and then slowly ramp up to, in, in some cases, as you'll see here, in excess of 100% of their design capacity even within the first 12 months. And this high availability is actually key to our design approach and our project implementation strategy. So our clients really benefit from all this effort uh, that we put in to make sure they have the best start and get back that return on investment very quickly. But ISO smelt isn't the only copper smelting technology or lead smelting technology, so I thought I should just touch on what other options are out there and what really makes ISO smelt unique. Uh, within the smelting uh, space. 
So just to put forward a, a generic copper flow sheet, this is taken from the Davenport Extractor Metallurgy of Copper book. Uh, you'll see here we have the, the option of an isosmelt uh, for treating concentrates. Uh, there's also submerged tweer uh, smelting furnaces, be they bottom blown or side blown. Uh, there's the flash smelting furnace technology or the Mitsubishi multi furnace technology. Um, so really when we look at all these technologies, what sets isosmelt apart in the bigger picture? And really what sets it apart is what happens with the lance in the centre of the vessel. So what we have is a top submerged lance. So the lance comes in the centre of the vessel and then through the submergence and the ejection of the air and oxygen provides a vast amount of turbulence within the centre of the vessel. And you'll see that this thing, this turbulence then allows for the feed materials that drop in to rapidly react with the bath. And actually what occurs within these process reactions is that the oxygen gets imparted into the bath uh, by the lance and then that oxidizes the slag which is then acts to reduce the feed coming into the furnace. Now this also acts in the reverse way in a reduction process but this really highlights the key difference of the isosmelt compared to other technologies. We have this turbulent slag bath where all of the reactions are taking place. And through the turbulence of the slag, we're able to digest many different types of feed materials. And therefore, we're able to achieve uh, much better throughput and flexibility in terms of the grade of the concentrates and the materials within them that we're able to treat. And this applies not only to copper, but also to the lead and the zinc and the nickel aspects of the technology. So just to highlight again on the advantages of this isosmelt technology, every single plant that we've built has been successful. Uh, we have a proud history of development from Mount Isa in the late 80s to early 90s for the lead and the copper technologies. And uh, that's now been over 25 years of ongoing operating experience we've had with the technology. There's a very high flexibility due to this turbulence that we create through the, uh, the injection of the air and oxygen into the molten slag bath. And we've been able to gain a vast amount of knowledge through all the plant designs that we've done throughout the, the history of the technology. And this means that we have an unmatched technology transfer for our clients through our training programs and through all the expertise that we uh, impart to our licensees to be able to run this technology at, at its best and peak performance. Now smelting is also a core business of the Glencore Group and we have four isosmelt furnaces within the Glencore Group and as we've talked about uh, with the other technologies tonight, uh, Glencore would not be using these technologies if they weren't the best and weren't able to achieve uh, the best results and the best outcomes for them. Now we also supply ongoing support to all our licensees and we're able to achieve a very fast ramp up. And uh, th that's even in some cases achieved the nameplate capacity within three months. And I'll go into that uh, later on in this presentation. So just looking at all of the plants that we've uh, uh, done throughout the, the different sites. So we'll see here Mount Isa in the early 90s. Uh, so a 1 million ton per annum plant. Uh, so we'll see, you can see then throughout the 90s or a number of plants installed and then throughout the 2000s and now uh, more recently we've continued to install many different sizes of isosmol plants for many different purposes. And you can see here uh, with some of the plants, so within the, the Chinese plants, so YCC, that client came back to us in uh, 2009 and we put another furnace in for that existing client. Uh, into Zambia. So we've had repeat business for the isosmelt technology from a number of our licensees. In terms of throughput, we're now bordering on breaking the 10 million tons per annum of uh, concentrate feed through the isosmelt technology and that's really a, a testament to the achievement of all the hard work of the people that have been involved in the isosmelt technology throughout the many year, years of its development and operation. So what's behind this successful history? Uh, really the first thing that, that I want to highlight is this approach 
uh, that we've had to develop this technology through to fruition. So it involved incremental scale up. We started this in the 1970s where we looked at the, the first concepts and the move through to the lab scale. Then in the 80s, the, the, the pilot scale and demonstration scale. And then we moved into the 90s with the industrial implementations. And then the full scale plants in the, the early 90s through to what we see today as our largest plant. So you can see that we've, we've applied a very uh, logical approach in incremental scale up to the technologies that we've done. Now we've done this so we can prove the viability uh, for each stage without skipping any of the steps involved in the development of the smelting technology. Now we've been able to make sure that the process can be adapted to treat many different types of concentrates once it's commercialized. And we've successfully developed an effective technology transfer method to all of our licensees so we can minimize their technical risk and maximize their productivity. And we've then gone on and provided continuous ongoing support to all of our licensees. So in terms of uh, looking at some operating data from the ISA smelt sites. I thought the best place to start is the, the Mount Isa copper ISA smelt plant. So the guys on site will be going through this with you uh, shortly. Uh, but just to give you a bit of an idea of uh, the, the sort of design values of the plant, uh, you can see here a nominal target feed rate of 170 tonnes an hour. Uh, so we push that up higher uh, when it's required and when the feed allows us to. You can see here typical uh, copper concentrate grade as well as the moisture content and typical operating parameters in terms of the MAC grade and the silica to iron ratio. So here you'll see a number of uh, a view of the plant, but we'll uh, cross to the guys on site a bit later just for more details on this. So now to one of our other isosmel plants. So this was uh, the biggest one that was built uh, between 2000 and 2010. So this was the Southern Peru Copper Isosmel plant in ELO. Uh, so this is able to treat 1.2 million tons per annum. So it has a nominal feed rate of about 165 tons per hour, and uh, it's uh, smelting a, a mat to about a 62 to a 63 percent copper in mat, uh, with a reasonably low silica to iron ratio on slag. And the reason for this is because Southern Peru and their concentrate had a higher alumina. So we worked together with them to work out a fluxing strategy and an operating regime that they'd be able to achieve uh, the targets in terms of having an operable process and fluidity of slag for the actual isosmelt melt and settling furnaces to achieve their targets in terms of throughput and copper and slag. So the last ISIS melt which we built and uh, which was commissioned in early 2015 is the Kinsanchi Copper ISIS melt. So this is located in the northwest province uh, within Zambia in a town of Sowesi. Uh, so this uh, plant was designed for uh, nominal uh, rates of 1.2 million tons per annum and that equated to a design concentrate feed rate of between 160 to 170 tons per hour depending on grade. Now here at this, this site, uh, we had a, a standard MAC grade of 60% and we allowed for a variability in terms of the, the chemistry or the fluxing that we had applied there. Now, the, the interesting thing with Consanchi was that they did have a very different feed, uh, which had a higher organic carbon content. So again, we worked with them in terms of uh, being able to supply them the right information so that would do, uh, the correct decisions could be made in terms of what was required on the plant for them to be able to achieve uh, the throughput and the ramp up that was required. Uh, so you'll see here the Consanchi site, there's a, a photo here of the Isis melt building here, as well as the, the whole plant itself. Um, and this is a, a photo here you'll see uh, down the bottom right hand corner, uh, which is of the, the tapping of the Isis melt furnace uh, through our water cooled copper tapping blocks and the uh, uh, Glencore Technology launder. Now the interesting story with Consanchi is in terms of its plant performance. And that is that they were able to achieve their nominal or their nameplate capacity within three months of startup. Uh, so they, they had an exceptional commissioning, and this is a real testament to uh, both the Consanchi uh, team 
uh, from, the, from the site side, uh, for the engineering side, and also the Glencore technology side. We all collaborated together to make sure that they had the best tools and the best uh, outcomes possible available to them so that they could really succeed and achieve what they needed to. Now the smelter performed so well that uh, within the first four months of production, they'd almost smelted all of the concentrate that was on site. So you'll see here uh, in the second part of the graph, there's a dip. And the main reason for that is that uh, th there was not enough concentrate to supply this smelter with feed. Now once uh, at the, within 12 months, uh, there was the mines had been able to ramp up to meet the concentrator, uh, to meet the, the smelting plant's uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, then they were able to easily meet the, the design rate and actually within the past 12 months they've been able to on a month by month basis beat or exceed the actual maximum design capacity of this plant. So again this is a real testament to, to the team at Consanchi, the team here at Glencore and the engineering departments as well. So when we think about, we've discussed a lot about uh, the Isosmelt technology, we also wanted to then think about well what is the next step? So the next step is what we consider the ISA smelt ISA convert or the double ISA flow sheet. So this is involving an ISA smelt plant to smelt primary smelting concentrate and then move on to the converting step which is where we treat the, the mat which is formed in the ISA smelt and we smelt and we convert it all the way through to blister copper which then can be put into standard anode furnaces for uh, production of anodes to then go to electrolytic refining. So at this moment we're in the process of uh, building and we're looking to commission this uh, technology with our partners uh, in the industry and it's uh, definitely a, what, uh, a space to, for everyone to watch and uh, this is going to be the future of uh, the copper smelting world. So at this point I'd like to cross over to Ben Hogg who's uh, in the Mount Isa copper smelter control room and he's going to be going through with uh, the various personnel on site, uh, how that plant is performing and all of the aspects of that technology there. So thank you very much, Ben. Thanks, Danko. I'm up here in uh, the level seven control room at Mount Isa, on top of the uh, copper Isa smelt up here. Uh, with me, I've got Andrew Spiro. He's one of our more experienced and uh, more enthusiastic operators. Um, thanks for coming along, Andrew. Um, Thank you. You've been working with the Isosmelt plant for quite some time. Let us know when you uh, started and what sort of roles you've done. So I started back in uh, '91 on the small demo plant uh, that was on the north side of the oil. We used to do one pot an hour of mat out of that, and we just run that one until we couldn't run it any further. And uh, we all got transferred over to the other smelt that we're standing on now. And uh, we just started the commissioning of that plant halfway through '92, just uh, marking water lines, pulling water, and all that sort of stuff until it was ready to be uh, commissioned. And uh, since then, I've learned basically all the jobs started from the ground up, tapping, lagman, uh, that's a feed, feed prep area, and RHFs, we just had the one RHF back then, and uh, learned all that and then uh, made my way up to the control room where I learned the gas handling in CRO. Um, yeah, so it's, I've been doing it for a few years now, around about 18 years. Uh, had a small break in the middle and uh, come back again in 2010 and uh, so I've uh, helped with the commissioning of the last rebrick with the Mets, helped them to uh, get the plant where it should be so we can uh, start feeding the furnace and uh, yeah. Good, excellent. So. Sounds like you've uh, seen plenty of things. What are, I guess, what are some of the features of the Oz smelt plant that you've come to appreciate over that time period? So it's uh, really easy to learn the different areas. It's uh, uh, forgiving uh, to operate, so it's you know it's very easy uh, areas to work in. 
especially some of the areas like gas handling and that. So uh, it's accessible to the to the uptake, so um, you're not actually hurting yourself out there. It's, um, you know, uh, you know the concept of the operation is uh, is quite uh, easy for people to pick up, and um, so it's. It's very easy to learn it actually. Um, you don't have to be a professional in, in smelting to learn how to operate an ice smelt. Yeah, well, I guess we've seen that in some of the remote areas like Mount Isa and some of the developing countries. Um, I guess we don't have to rely on lots of technical expertise to run plants in those areas. Yeah, so that's good. That's really good. Uh, what else can you tell us? So, the the plant is uh, really easy to ramp up, so we can ramp it up or ramp it down within the, you know, 10, 15 minutes, all depends how many tons we're taking off and putting back on it at the time. So, you know, we can move between 80 ton and 170 ton an hour, you know, roughly 20 minutes for that sort of move, movement. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, so we can switch it on, turn it up, turn it down. And um, over the years, you've treated quite a range of concentrates here, different sizes, different moistures, different compositions, so fairly flexible in that respect. Yeah, no, you can uh, put almost anything through this place, so it, uh, all you've got to do is adjust the moisture to suit the feed, and uh, so we can get good, uh, consistent pellets, drop it into the furnace. It works really well. Good, thanks for that. Um, so we're going to have a quick look outside. We've got Shane Luck, the supervisor, out there with a, a view of level six. Um, do you want to just describe what we can see out there? So what you can see there in the in the right middle of the uh, screenshot there, you, you can see the lance that's uh, going down into the bar. You can see a small movement in the lance, so they say you now you've got good. Uh, uh, control of the lance in the bar, and uh, you can see a slight puff coming out of the uh, feed port. That's how we know we've got good uh, control with the draft. Uh, over to the left a bit further, you can see the uh, the feed dropping into the furnace through the feed port. Um, all that structure there is made from uh, resistant material and the conveyor system as well. And we also uh, maintain a good draft so we don't let any extra heat coming out of the out of the vessel. You can see the uh, standby burner directly above the feed sheet. Uh, we use that to maintain heat in the vessel when we shut down. And also we can use that as well with the blank pulled over the top of the uptake. You know, it's, uh, Nice flat area out there for us to work on. Um, around the back there is the uptake, the stroke, uh, where the gas handler spends most of his time. Uh, you know, keeping it nice and tidy out there. Good, and the, um, the conveyor belt in that feed looks close to the port. The splash and heat and anything that's coming out of that feed port. Yeah. How do you guys manage that? So, it, the, the actual feed belt is slightly back and anything that comes out of the furnace comes straight up. Uh, like again, like I said again, uh, we control with draft. We've got actual probes on the feed chute where it gives us a negative and positive pressure so we know which way we're going with the draft. And um, yeah, we can, we can also move the conveyor to where we need it to be. You know, we can bring it forward or take it back a bit so we can get a nice uh, uh, drop into the feed, feed board where we need it to be. Yeah. Keep the maintenance crew happy then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're not too happy when we see the uh, scrapers now and then. If we do have small things that go wrong, like we, we can lose the uh, ID fan. And some of the heat out of the vessel, but that's where we're at. Good. Now, looking at the lance there, on average, how long 
is always last in this verse. So we can, we can uh, a good lance. We can we can have it in the in the vessel for mud. Yep. So and on average, over a whole campaign, like uh, having a lance in the use. How long does it last? What smelting? Yeah. Two weeks? Yeah. yeah, fair enough. And when you change that lens, how long does it take you? About an hour. So that's that's comfortably. Um, that's uh, taking the old one off, putting it in the rack, putting the new one on, getting the isolations done, pre zero, making the vessel. About an hour. Sort of. yeah. All right. Now, uh, finally, you've been involved in a bit of training of smelting personnel from other eyes of smelting. They've sent um, some people over here to learn the, the ways of operating the isosmelt. Um, what can you tell us about that? So we uh, had a group, uh, the uh, Zambians come over and they were all actually supervised and metallurgists. And uh, we, well, I trained them uh, upstairs to uh, learn how to drive the plant in the control room, the metallurgical side of the the feed as well, and it was it's quite easy for them to pick it up. It's you know, pretty smart anyway. So uh, you know they went away from here, and basically the control room was relatively uh, no problems upstairs. Most of the stuff was you know over the the lane side along the plant, like the tapping and that. But the uh, the control room dog runners they went away from here. Pretty happy. Yeah. All right. Now, um, on the other side of that, I suppose when those guys head over to their uh, new plant and start it up, that makes it very easy for them to transition quickly from absolute commissioning and start up into uh, ramping the plant up to yes. design it. So it uh, works very well. We've seen that quite a few times. And of course, then they've got some uh, friends and family in the Oz Smelt family, so they can always bring up and have a chat to you or whoever else they've met uh, during their training program. Um, right, we might have a chat to Dave now. Okay, cheers. So, this is Dave Mansack. Uh, he's currently the Dr. Snodder Metallurgy Superintendent. Uh, he's also worked uh, in the acid plant across the road and a flash smelter um, recently. Um, so, welcome, Dave. Thanks, Good. MIM has uh, recently finished a rebrick. Uh, how long was the campaign that led up to that rebrick? Yeah, look, so our last campaign was around for four years. Um, but the last two campaigns four years. We have some really uh, good control of the uh, refractive wear rates that we achieved through our really good territory control. I believe that's some of the longest campaigns we've had on the whole of the island running all over the world. So we're really pleased with And what determines when and how often you do a re -rick? Yeah, look, um, it's really the refractory wear rates that determine the uh, when a rubric's done. However, we do do, um, I guess, one it stops every two years. Uh, every two years or so, because um, we need to do a uh, statutory inspection for our boilers, and we also try and line it up with some screening events in the asthma plant. Typically, uh, a red rig will take 28 days. Um, however, this last one that we've just done, we've been a little bit longer than that. We're actually be doing some uh, additional work in our off-gas system, which um, amazingly, we actually haven't had to do some new work on that since 1992. So it's, um, it's gone that long without any significant work, which is uh, really quite pleasing again. Yeah. As I mentioned just before, you've worked in a flash smelter. Give us your thoughts on what are the, the main differences between the two technologies. Yeah, so I guess an ISO smelter it's, it's a really, uh, really flexible smelting technology. Uh, it's a very 
easy to learn. Uh, some of the skill sets that are you need in the flash filter are quite different to the Oscar. Um, I guess that's one of the benefits that the Oscar has. Uh, also noted that the fee that the Oscar was able to able to treat um, is maybe quite a wide 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 array of uh, fees that we can have. Um, yeah, so that was quite surprising for me. Uh, some of the treatment, the uh, beach, and it's, uh, uh, How many is tons of stock do you need to hold on site for us that lending and feeding to the ice snow? Yeah, so we hold uh, about five to ten days worth of stock on site. Uh, it's about 20 to 30,000 tons in our uh, feed system. Um, now, from an operating point of view, you've been here a year or so now. What sort of support do you get from Bankport Technology at the site here? Uh, GT are actually quite, uh, really quite flexible. We, we uh, call them up and ask them questions all the time. Uh, people like yourself uh, quite, you know, quite frequently uh, helping us out with our uh, one small operation. Uh, also, that some of the slave chemistry aspects that we're starting to challenge as we uh, move into a customer's number, uh, so then we more smelter. Yeah, so I guess the supporters uh, really use watch patterns. Um, a lot of the, the GT people that we use have got security at the site and plan experience as well, which is um, uh, really quite pleasing because they're able to work in our uh, people on the plant. And actually know what's going on when we ask the questions. All right, now uh, we're going to switch over to a view of the uh, tapping floor, but uh, I don't think Shane's quite ready yet. So we might um, we might actually show the view we've got on the screen here, and we can uh, talk to that. We'll just move this over. This is the view we've got of the tapping floor here. Uh, so it's the one on this side here. You want to talk us through that one, Dave? So what, what you can see there is uh, you can see uh, the, the tap holes open there on number one mortar. So you can see the wood uh, that covers the launder there. It's got the burners in it. Also, it takes away any gases that come out while it's happening. And to the uh, right of that, you can see the uh, second tap hole. So we alternate from one RHF to two RHFs, so we put two launders, so we swap around and clean the launder and uh, go to the next one. And you can see over further to the to the right there, you can see the uh, play gun drill, and uh, that's what we use to open the tap hole. And also, just at the bottom of the screen there, we've got the larger control unit that operates that unit. So the boys will be out there now watching the the lane side, and uh, you can see one of the tappers moved there now. And uh, so he's getting ready. He's just doing. Bit of maintenance say, clean up a little bit, and uh, it'll be you'll get ready shortly to uh, remote control that uh, play gun over to the uh, laundry to shut it off. Uh, and how how long does a tap take to so the furnace level, and how long are you shut for after that to clean the launders? So okay, so it takes about uh, fifteen minutes to fill it and about 10 to 15 minutes to bring it down to the required length side. And it uh, takes about five minutes, two tappers, to maintain a launder. It's all cop cool, so it's pretty easy to uh, clean. They uh, break it up in pieces, throw away the big pieces out and uh, blow the smaller pieces into the RHS. All right, excellent. Thank you for that, uh, 
Spiro, and thank you, Dave.